and welcome to Banking Transformed. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. McKinsey found that 90% of executives believe that COVID crisis will fundamentally change the way they do business over the next five years. Unfortunately, only 21% feel confident they are prepared to capture this new growth opportunity. At a time when technology solutions are abundant, an innovation culture is required more than ever in banking. This is because status quo is not an option in a marketplace that is changing faster than ever before, with competitors of all sizes creating solutions at scale. We are fortunate to have Amy Radin, founder and principal of Pragmatic Innovation Partners and author of the award-winning book, The Changemaker's Playbook, How to Seek, Seek, and Scale Innovation at Any Company. Welcome to the show, Amy. I'm, I'm so happy to have you on the show today, not only because of your extensive history in financial services, but because your perspective on innovation is so well tested in the trenches during your tenure in City, E-Trade, AXA, and elsewhere. Your book, The Changemaker's Playbook, How to Seek, Seed, and Scale Innovation in Any Company, is really the user's guide for any person or organization involved in the innovation process. Can you share a bit about your background and how you came about writing this book? You know, I think what happened with me, um, and I was probably influenced by the fact that I grew up in a family business. My dad owned a corner drugstore in Brooklyn. And, you know, when you're in a family business, you know, food on the table and your well-being is very much a function of, you know, do you understand your customers' needs and are you anticipating them and really giving them a reason to come to you and they have a lot of other choices. So I'm sure, although I hated working in the store, that it was a big positive influence on me. But throughout my corporate career, I was just always the kind of person who was attracted to what's new, what's next, what's coming. And so even though it was many years before I actually had the word innovation or digital in my title, I always worked on kind of the front end of what was happening. And When I decided to leave the corporate world and start a new career, I saw that um, even though at that point we were over a decade into the sort of digital era, that people were still struggling with the same challenges over and over again. And I, I said, you know, I have this operator perspective of working in a very large, very complex very results-driven and financially-oriented financial institution, you know, Citigroup, and and was surrounded by people doing that kind of work and led teams of people doing that kind of work. And I said, you know, I really want to share not just my expertise, but the expertise of other people who've taken on this challenge and bring the lessons learned to help those innovation operators. Um, The only other thing I'll add is, so I went and, you know, God knows the world doesn't need another book on innovation, right? And so I said, well, what's going to be different about my book? And what I what I saw pretty quickly is that is that among the top titles on innovation, um, they're all coming, you know, primarily from academicians and consultants. Yep. And I said, you know, what's different about yep. me is that I was actually in the hot seat and I had to look my CFO in the eye and and deliver results. And that's a different perspective. Well, so that's really how well, I came to well, do it. It's interesting because you know your your book you it's you know you say that, that it's a playbook and and what that was interesting because from going through your book you know it was interesting that it really isn't theory it's really practiced it's pragmatic it's very implement implementable um but your book was published in 2018 and to say the least a lot has happened since then um did the foundation of your book um to seek seed and scale innovation stand the test of time during the disruptive period of the pandemic yeah, absolutely. And that's a great question. So it's it's coincidentally, I had um, the book won a really nice award in 2020, a best yep. book, uh, a best book award yep. from an organization called Book Excellence. And so at that point, my publisher said, well, why don't we do a paperback? And I said, I asked that same question, you know, with everything happening, is it still relevant? So I actually read the book again. Um, and I was like, you know, except for the fact that some of the people, because the book includes stories and case examples from about 50 other people who I interviewed and did research with, um, except for the fact that some people were now in new roles, so their titles had changed, um, the advice was not only still relevant, but it was intensely more relevant because the need to the need to engage, the need to build the right capabilities, the right culture, 
the right teams, um, the right methodologies to, to get from an idea to something at scale that has value to customers and has commercial value has only intensified. Right. Yeah. And, and, and again, you, your playbook was really how to do it into the, really, as I said earlier, into the trenches. And, and you know, as you said, that doesn't change. That's still very important. It, it doesn't change. And in fact, when I when I wrote the book, I had this vision, I guess, being a pretty practical person, I had this vision of the book being, you know, it would be on the shelf or in the Kindle and it would be dog eared. And my readers would be, you know, folding down the pages or sticking in the post-its or they, they'd run into a problem and they say, well, let me go back and see what what Amy would yeah. do. And um, yeah. and I meet readers today and that's exactly what they're doing. So it's very, it's very, very gratifying. But yeah, the needs have only intensified. The needs have only intensified. So, in financial services, many organizations are reassessing the perspective on innovation. Unfortunately, our research that we did for the Digital Bank Report found that while financial services executives understood the importance of innovation, few know where to start or how to structure innovation in their organization. Where should a, a bank or credit union start? And I think a lot of times what stops people is they ask that question. They don't know where to start. So when you look at the whole issue, it seems so overwhelming. And you think about companies like Apple or Google or Netflix, and you go like, oh my God, how am I going to do that? I'm sitting in a bank um, where the, the standards and the understanding of the culture are so different. And, and it's funny, just last week, I was speaking with the COO of a, a pretty major North American bank. Um, and if they have an ambition to innovate their customer experience, which obviously for banking is one of the most fertile grounds and one of the most important grounds for innovation. And it's like a really smart guy who's doing a great job running his business and really cares about his employees and his customers and his brand, you know, checking a lot of the right boxes. And I was like, you know, which <laughs> for one answer is you just got to start. Like the Nike slogan, just do right. it. But at a practical right. level, you know, let's assume that one of that that one of your top opportunities is the customer experience. Start by picking out, um, you know, what are some of the most important aspects of the customer experience for you? So, say the account opening process or the first sixty days of of owning the product. Map out the customer journey. Bring together a small cross functional group of people who really understand what's happening with customers. Do a journey map. Then say, okay, within that journey, what are the critical moments of truth? And what are the biggest pain points that we think people are experiencing today? And of course, you can validate all this with your internal data. You know, if you're doing customer service tracking and stuff, you have data to back this up. And then you do a map of, okay, what's the go-to journey? How do I want it to be? And you look at your gaps. And those are great starting points for innovation. Yeah. Right? So how yeah. am I going to innovate the moments of truth in the customer experience? to really delight my customers so that I can um, differentiate my brand in a way that, you know, makes me a preferred financial institution. So you can see there's discipline and, and method to how to do it. And um, very much as we were talking before, I draw from my background as a direct marketer. You know, I'm very, I have a real process orientation. It's that you can apply some real process and discipline to do this. It's just maybe not, it may not be the methods and process that you apply to running something steady state. Well, it's interesting. We interviewed Dom Ventura, who um, is now in charge of digital um, mark, digital transformation at uh, U.S. Bank, but he also was in charge of innovation in the past. And it's interesting because he said, you know, too often financial institutions see innovation as adding something. And he says, now more than ever, we're speed and simplicity. And you talked about new account opening process where it's so important. You know, sometimes innovation is actually doing that journey map you mentioned and removing parts, you know, removing the process so that you can have an experience like opening an Apple card or opening an account at Chime. Um, and in the past, many financial institutions built innovation labs uh, that look good to the investor public, but many times did not move the needle with re regard to transformation transformative improvements. Are there innovation labs, are they productive or simply are they usually innovation theater in your perspective? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm skeptical about of some of the labs that I've seen. I mean, I've definitely seen situations, sadly, 
where the, the CEO and the executive team want to put up a lab because the board is, you know, asking where's the focus on oh, innovation. Yeah. And so they, <clears throat> you know, they say we're gonna go spend a hundred couple hundred million dollars, we're gonna pitch a tent in Silicon Valley and put up a lab, and we're gonna keep it really far away from the business because we don't want them to ruin it. And I think, you know, it, it's like anything that you're investing in in your business. I mean, financial institution people are really good at doing business cases and figuring out, you know, what am I gonna do with my money to grow my business? You have to say, what's the problem I'm really trying to solve and what's the best way to solve it? And one of the things, frankly, that we struggled with a little bit at, at City, but my team had a firm opinion on it was, yeah, surely there's a lot of bureaucracy and heavy process and rules and risk management in a big existing successful business that may not be terribly helpful to innovation. In fact, it, a lot of, some of the stuff could kill innovation unintentionally. So, however, there's also incredibly valuable institutional knowledge. And you've got people, you've got highly talented employees who see the future and want to be part of it. And if you ultimately, as you come upon and validate innovations that you want to scale, you need that mothership. You know, you need that organization yeah. to achieve rapid scale. You know, unless you plan to build a whole separate brand, and that's something completely different. But ultimately, to scale quickly, I'd say most financial institutions, you're going to want to come back to the fold. And so, Maintaining that balance of having a team that are able to operate um, in a way that's appropriate for innovation, um, it takes sponsorship from an executive who can who can figure out one of the times to break the rules um, because the rules of innovation are different versus saying, we're going to put these people on the other side of the country or in a whole different right. place. Um, and right. deliberately divorce them from the organization. I think it's a real loss. And and also it's unbelievably demoralizing yeah. to the people who you've got yeah. in the organization. Well, it's interesting. You know, it's not well, for it's everybody. It's not for everybody. Yeah. But but people who yeah. see the future and have a career runway um, get it. And they want to see these efforts succeed. They may not know what to do. They may feel personally at risk. Um, but those are all issues that can be addressed. You know, it's interesting. As with any component of digital banking transformation, the key to success is really leadership, as you mentioned, that fully supports the process and a culture that reinforces the process at all levels throughout the organization. From your perspective, and you've worked for banks and worked with banks for, for years, how can this be achieved by leaders and employees who have never before seen innovation as part of their job? How do they, how do they reconstruct their mindset to, to support innovation culture or even build an innovation culture if they've never seen what it feels and, and works like? Yeah, well, as I said a couple of minutes ago, you need that top executive sponsor. And we were very fortunate, and in my team particularly at City that we had an incredibly tremendous sponsor in, in the CEO, the person who was CEO at the time of the credit card business, uh, who really saw the need to carve out the breathing room and the resources to really focus on innovation as a specific priority of the business. And I think if you don't have that at the, to at the very top of the house, it can be very difficult. However, that's, that's a requirement, but that is not gonna guarantee success because right. you still need to right. build uh, credibility with the teams around you, and I think one of the ways to do it is you've got to you've got to find ways to collaborate with the people, you know, with your colleagues and and peers in the business, and help them see their success in what you're trying to do. You know, so one way to do that is you you try to attack business problems where innovation can be the answer. And the business problems are on the priority screen, you know, on the priority list of those executives. It also takes a lot of communications. It takes some education. And frankly, it's not for everyone. I mean, I, you know, my team, we would look around the organization and say, you know, who are the people who are really excited about this and up for the challenge and want to be part of this? Invite them all day long to our brainstorming sessions. 
include them. You know, they were the people who posted for internal transfers into my organization and, and things like that. There are people who are sort of like, okay, I'm open minded, but you got to show me the way. Yeah. Okay, you can clearly. Yeah. There's the, then there are people who say like, I don't, I don't believe it. We don't need to do this. We could just do more of what we're doing. And you know what? You're not going to win everybody over. That's the nature of change. So just work with the people who sort of are completely, wow, we want to go there. How fast can you help us? And the people who are open-minded and and just don't even come with the agenda that you're going to convince everybody. I think that's really frustrating and it's not the best use of your energy. Now, now is, that the biggest, is that the biggest mistake organizations make when trying to implement changes, trying to force it? I mean, or are there other mistakes that organizations make in trying to truly require the embracing of change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, not everybody. If, if, if the change, if everybody agrees, you're probably not innovating hard enough. It's kind of like if you're if the things that you're experimenting with are always succeeding, if you never have failure in any of your tests, then you're probably not pushing the envelope as hard as you need to. So how important is we look at change and and you know, speed of change has honestly become a big issue since the pandemic that that financial institutions now realize we we have done research that shows that organizations rank themselves actually lower than they did before the pandemic on innovative culture and, and being able to implement leadership. And what's interesting is one of the ways that organizations have done this has been partnering with solution providers or even fintech competitors to create innovative solutions. How important is speed and simplicity in the process and the ability to open your mind to partnering with outsiders? I think it's I think it's really useful. Um, you know, one of the things that I think has helped me in my career, and I think it's it's a it's a trait of change makers and people who enjoy this work, is being curious and externally and market focused. So you know, when you're in a financial institution, you got you got a pretty full plate. You got a lot to do. It's very easy to just be absorbed heads down the what you have to deliver today and tomorrow and next week. Um, Anything you can do to increase your focus on what's going on outside is very helpful. And that's where external relationships, external partners, bringing in, uh, you know, technology companies is incredibly um, important. But that, you know, that culture of curiosity where you're looking outside and looking beyond the obvious suspects. You know, one of the things that we used to do, we really liked, I was really encouraged by one of my innovation mentors to look outside my sector for ideas. Because if you're always looking in your own sector, yeah. you run the risk of just being a follower and a copycat, you know, and people move around from company to company. So it, it becomes kind of incestuous and very groupthink oriented. So you diminish the chance of being innovative. We were very interested for a while in what we could learn, for example, from the weight loss industry. And like, why is that? Because people, unfortunately, manage their health and sometimes similarly to how they manage right. their money. You know, you have aspirations. Right. You know you should save for retirement. You know you shouldn't run a big balance at your credit card bill. You know you should lose 10 pounds. But, you know, what happens? And so we, we got really good learnings from, you know, looking within, you know, how do people manage their health? And what does that suggest about innovations and how we can help people with their financial needs? So it's just having that anything you can do to increase your external view is a um, really, really important source of ideas. You know, I, I probably should have started this with this question. I think about it. But, you know, when we define innovation, we look at innovation, you know, as as humans and as organizations, we sometimes think it's something new and exciting and way out there. Does innovation even have to be something that's brand new and disruptive or can an innovation simply be an improvement on a current solution or an introduction of a solution that may already be in the marketplace, but not for my institution? Yeah, I, you know, it's really interesting. Most, I saw, I saw data years ago. There was a, one of the, one of the um, innovation consultancies that we worked with presented us with data showing that, you know, over 90% of the innovations are incremental. And, you know, this is, yeah. you know, data from the last decade, but, 
and the market value of disruptive innovation may be greater. But if you're in a financial institution, there is an incredible amount of innovation you can do. And I said, going back to the customer experience around making it you know, more delightful and easier, and by the way, also probably more cost-effective for your customers to do business with you that can scale rapidly, that can impact your bottom line, and frankly, can help build credibility to start to do some of the more out there stuff. The other thing is, you don't know from the starting point if something is going to be disruptive or incremental. You know, you really, you can't say, you can't come to work. I mean, you could, I guess, but I wouldn't, rec- I wouldn't recommend coming to work and saying, okay, today I'm going to start on a disruptive innovation. You have no idea. You have to say, today I'm going to solve a customer, I'm going to start working on solving a customer problem that I have reason to believe is significant to a large number of customers so that if I'm able to solve this problem in a way that's differentiated in their eyes, I can impact uh, certain drivers of the business model. You know, it will attract more customers. It will deepen the relationships with my customers. And you know what? As you iterate and continue to build and grow and expand upon what you learn, it could become disruptive. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, you can't label things from the get-go. I think that that's... Uh, it's just not productive. So you, your background is pretty much the same as mine um, with a long tenure in direct marketing. From your perspective, how does data analytics and modern technologies play into the innovation process overall? Well, I think that, yeah, for me, and, and you know, as we were saying before, having, having grown up the first chapter one of my career was I spent uh, 14 years at American Express as a, as a direct marketer. So first of all, a world-class company that even before customer experience was sort of a thing, the very, very customer-focused company where everybody, everybody across all functions felt accountability for their impact on how customers were treated because we knew that that was what gave us um, premium pricing advantage and all kinds of benefits in the market. And um, I saw the connection between, um, you know, what does a direct marketer do? They work with large amounts of data and technology people to deliver personalized products and services and experiences and messaging to the audiences that they want to serve. And so, when um, when companies started calling, you know, 20 years ago about you know all of these dot coms that were starting, I was like, like, wow, I have really transferable skills. And so when I, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to go to City um, to lead the digital transformation in the very early days, where it was really almost a white slate. Right. Um, right. The, the the direct marketing skills translated very readily. And I, I still think they do. It's got that discipline and process orientation and sort of structure. But also what's really great about it is that experimentation is engineered into business model. And that's so core to having an innovator's mindset and an innovation process is that you're constantly trying things, you're experimenting, you're testing and learning, and you see tests that don't work as learning opportunities, not as failures. You know, things that keep helping you move forward to the right answer. So it was a great, you know, who knew at the time, uh, you know, I went to work for Amex because it's just a fabulous brand um, to do marketing right. and financial services, but it was a fantastic um, foundation for the latter parts of my career. So let's take a short break here and we'll recognize the sponsors of the podcast. Is your organization trying to embrace digital banking transformation in 2021? Are you trying to elevate the customer experience? Figure out what technology you want to implement to improve the customer journey. Look at data analytics to really better understand and personalize the customer experience. And you're trying to make it so that more of your employees can buy into and be part of your digital banking transformation If this sounds like you, I ask you to reimagine banking with our newest podcast sponsor, Microsoft. They give you the opportunity to unlock new opportunities at speed throughout innovative business models, deliver differentiated customer experiences across channels, products, and services, and redefine new ways of banking. 
Microsoft and its partner ecosystem help banks to achieve differentiation through sustainable growth, streamlining core systems, reducing cost and risk, and delighting customers and employees. If you're in the midst of a journey trying to figure out what to do next, maybe trying to find out what other organizations are doing to lift up their experience level, I really encourage you to look at Microsoft. For more information, visit Microsoft.com slash financial services. Welcome back. I'm joined today by Amy Radin, founder and principal of Pragmatic Innovation Partners and author of the award-winning book, The Changemaker's Playbook, How to Seek, Seed, and Scale Innovation in Any Company. We've been discussing the importance of innovation in post-crisis mode. So Amy, your book talks about change makers, those who dream big and are also committed to the execution of ideas. Besides these broad definitions, what differentiates a change maker in your perspective? Yeah, well, there are a couple of things. Um, the things that really come top to mind are, as, as we already talked about, definitely curiosity. You know, you, you are the, you're the kind of person who asks the next question, like, why is it like that? Um, as opposed to, oh, that's wrong. So you, you see possibilities. Um, you solve problems by collaborating. You know, this myth of the change maker or the innovator as a lone wolf, I think is really just that, um, you know, a myth. Um, you know, people hold Steve Jobs out there as a, as, as a lone wolf, but Steve Jobs surrounded himself with some pretty incredible people that, that were essential to making Apple become the world's most valuable and most admired brand. Um, I think you, you really want, you see those possibilities and you want to execute to create the future and you're not held back by fear. I think fear is one of the biggest derailers of innovation. And oh, yeah. don't get me wrong, I have plenty of anxiety about you know some of the things that that we've tried over the years with the teams that I've that I've been part of. But you're able to sort of keep that anxiety in check, and you surround yourself with great people. So again, this this spirit of collaboration and understanding that it really takes a village to make this stuff happen. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you know, you want to make a difference. You know, it's interesting. You talk you talk about those people that that can view things and and not be fearful. And uh, it's interesting because it, it's something you can grow into. You know, security and and confidence and things like this. And you know, as, as many of us found out, sometimes you're thrown into a fearful situation and come out live and you say, oh, "Okay, I can, I can handle this." I was probably afraid of something that that what wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it would be. So overall, what is the biggest opportunity you see in the financial services industry coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, I think that for financial services now, clearly around, you know, the customer experience, you know, if there's one thing that that everybody's talking about and that we've seen happen through COVID is people have embraced technology and a set of digital behaviors to do things they never would have done before. You know, in, in healthcare, yeah. in healthcare, telemedicine visits are up 600% since 2019. Just, and how many people, I'm sure you know people in your life, and I definitely know people in mine who would never have had a doctor's visit, you know, on telemedicine. And I think in financial services, people are much, people are in general integrating digital into their lives much more than anybody imagined uh, would be possible in such a short span of time. So I think that's the area where financial institutions need to focus. And I think as you, you know, you look at the generational transitions, where clearly, you know, those people we call digital natives are, you know, they're they're starting to own the economy, having a digital first, digital centered ability for people to bank, particularly on mobile devices, uh, but that integrate into, you know, with other channels and it's the overall relationship is going to become table stakes um, to have productive customer relationships across, you know, all the products and services that banks offer. That at the same time creates the biggest threat 
because you can't, innovation isn't the kind of thing that can operate with an on off switch. You know, you can't, I mean, companies try. Oh, this year, this year we don't have the money, so we're not going to do it. You know, off. Okay. Oh, now we really have to do it on. The problem is you need to be in the game. You need to be building momentum all the time and testing and learning all the time. So you can't, it's, you can't jump in and out. You have to constantly be in the game. And so I think that's the risk for leadership teams that don't see that they will be caught flat footed. And because change is happening more and more rapidly, they will risk being left behind. So finally, is being an innovation leader a function of asset size or ability to invest large sum of money in technology, analytics, human resources, and R&D? Or can any size organization differentiate through innovation? Yeah, that's a great question. So I have to tell you, you know, since I left the corporate world seven years ago and I started to engage with, with early stage startups and it was because I really, I wanted to be on the front line. You know, I wanted, I said, I wanted a front row seat to what's next. And, you know, one of the good things about being at a leading financial services brand is everybody wants to do business with you. So it's pretty easy to stay connected. You know, once you're on your own, it's a little different. So I started to engage with early stage startups. And the thing that really blew me away almost from the get-go is how much they get done with so little. So, you know, in, you know, big company, you want to do a customer insight project. Oh, you need a couple of hundred thousand dollars. You know, founder at a startup, they call six people who they find on social media and interview them. And you know what? It's good enough. So you have to, you, I think resources should not be, do not need to be an obstacle at the early, very earliest stages when you're trying to just figure out Am I onto something that has merit? That takes grit and a little creativity, uh, maybe permission or maybe forgiveness from your management if you, you know, cross a little bit of a line. But I, I don't think you need a ton of resources. And if we have time for a quick story, I'll tell you one of the stories I, I tell in my book is about a, a medical device entrepreneur. Who, who wanted to create, and you can imagine the standards for medical device approval are incredible in this country. Um, he built his first prototype, which was sort of this inflatable device to cushion people falling and falling in the United States. It's like a multi-billion dollar cost, the medical you know, establishment. Um, his first prototype was built off um, inner tubes of tires from cars in a junkyard that he took to his tailor and had stitched up for a couple of bucks. And that initial prototype was enough of a proof of concept to get enough early stage, you know, angel seed money to get to a real prototype that eventually got him um, uh, an agreement to conduct a, a legitimate experiment with a, with a leading hospital. So I always think about my friend Drew and the junkyard and I go, you know, it's not, your size is not an excuse. You know, you, you got to look for a way and be really creative. But, you know, a great way to end the broadcast because, you know, it, everybody I ask, I ask, can small organizations do whatever we're talking about? Because I think a lot of times organizations think, you know, geez, we talk about these great ideas and we can't do it. And, and you can't. And the reality is success can be scaled. And, you know, still the, the dynamics of serving the community is still key for the smaller organizations. And that's in and of itself a way to get community involvement behind your innovation. So, Amy, thank you so much for being on the show today. You know, it's great to have you. Great to have you talk about your book. How do people get your book? Well, you can go to any of the, you know, online e-tailers, Kalia, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everybody else. You can also visit my website, um, Amy, Amy at amyraden.com or email me at amyraden.com if you want to sign up for my newsletter. But definitely you can buy the book through any of the online um, e-tailers. And if any of your audience are issued uh, interested in a bulk purchase for their teams, you should just contact me directly because I can arrange that at a favorable price. Great. And thanks for being on the show today, Amy. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. It's really fun to talk to you. 
Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, where it is the top five banking podcast. I generally appreciate the support you've provided since we started this endeavor. If you enjoy what we're doing, please be sure to follow Banking Transform in your favorite podcast app. In addition, take 30, 45 seconds to show some love in the form of a review. It means the world to me. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and check out the research we're doing on digital banking transformation, the future of work in banking, retail banking innovation, and the changing dynamics of financial marketing for the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Roll Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, make every day a learning experience. Thank <music> you.